Hey, interesting, uh, you know, sometimes when you sit behind the desk here on the microphone, there are themes that tend to pop up, and I, you know, there's a theme coming up tonight for me. You know, you, you feel what the Spirit is saying to you. Uh, just about people who are bruised tonight, people who feel like they're broken, and I, I want to just sort of speak into that a little bit as the evening goes on. But my uh, next guest that I caught up with during the week, uh, her name is Zandra Carroll, and she worked for Ravi Zacharias Ministries, uh, RZIM. And uh, you'll know now that, so well, you may know some of the story of Ravi Zacharias and some allegations have come out. The man has passed away, but it looks like there were some pretty nefarious things going on. And of course, for the staff, the people who worked with them, dedicated their life to serving that ministry, some of them had been smashed really, really badly. And we talked about last week when I, when I talked with Justin Humphreys um, from uh, 318 uh, in the UK uh, about how we can mistreat employees. Some of these folks have felt you know, pretty abused and beaten up. So I thought we'd talk to Sandra Carroll, uh, someone wh- whom I know and have met in the past. We've spoken at conferences together. And uh, we're going to listen to her this evening. Uh, just tell some of her story uh, about what God has done with the broken pieces that came out of that ministry. 0508 543 I'd love to hear from you this evening. You can text 8168. Keyword, of course, is uh, talk. Uh, lots to talk about tonight and um, if you've got some feedback on the conversation with Michael Thomas around Jewish uh, traditions I'd love to hear from you as well you can email me jp at lifefm.co.nz The Talk Sessions with JP Well the time is just on two after eight and here is an interview that I recorded with uh, with Zandra uh, during the week well, I love the power of social media. Now, not everyone loves the power of social media, but what happens for me is every now and again, a name pops up that I recognize, I remember, and I smile fondly when I remember the name. And Zandra Carroll is one of those names. Zandra and I spent some time at a uh, speaking at a conference together and had a wonderful conversation at Wellington Airport. It was a Christchurch, no Christchurch Airport, it was. Uh, and it's partly memorable because I was late for my flight chatting away, having wonderful coffee and cake, and all of a sudden I realised I had to go through security and I was not going to make it. So I had to dash off and leave her sitting in in the airport. But she was in New Zealand doing some work around apologetics. And I wanted to talk to her partly because uh, her her name popped up on my social media and just reminded me of a number of things. Um, But first of all, let let me just welcome you and introduce you. So Sandra, uh, Sandra, welcome uh, from all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Hi there. Hi, thank you. I'm so happy to see your face and hear your voice. And I apologize again for making you late to your flight. It was definitely my fault, but we were having the most wonderful, deep conversation about all things theology and Bible, and it was great. So <laughs> it was a great conversation. And yes, I'm just a little less hair than I had before and a few more wrinkles. So that's all right. The time goes on. Hey, you spent some time uh, in New Zealand, um, actually at the University of Wellington, didn't you, Te uh, Herangawaka? Uh, and you were doing some con- uh, conversation, uh, conversation, conservation biology. You're still pursuing part of that career? Yeah. So, uh, yes, it was a master's degree in conservation. Um, and I am pursuing more the conversation side of that, <laughs> um, traveling around and speaking to people about um, why we as Christians should be involved in the, in conservation um, and why it matters um, what we do with the earth. We, we of all people, have, have a huge reason um, to treat the earth well uh, because we, we believe that it doesn't ultimately belong to us. It belongs to our creator. So, um, yeah, that's, that's one of the things I've been speaking about pretty often over the past few years, um, taking what I learned in my master's degree and applying it through Christian apologetics, um, speaking not just uh, at the secular sphere, but also on the Christian sphere pretty often. It's a fascinating subject because I think uh, for me, and I, and, I, and I think, you know, I kind of get this feeling talking to people that, that the green movement, uh, which can be associated with kind of left-wing politics and things, has kind of usurped the, the conversation about conservation. And, and I wonder if Christians maybe kind of don't look at it in the, in the right light because it feels like it's been, the subject's been captured by somebody else. Do you, do you kind of come across those conversations? Oh, you're so right, JP. And not just Christians, but people in general. I went to the grocery store the other day and I had my, um, you know, reusable bags 
that I was taking through through the grocery store and the clerk made some really surprisingly nasty comments to me. Um, I think he was assuming I was, you know, very uh, a, of a certain political bent which I'm not, um, and was talking about, you know, oh, well, you must believe in climate change and all this, this nonsense and saying all these things to me. Um, so, and he may have been Christian, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, there is certainly, you're, you're right to identify that, that there is oftentimes an assumption that if you're going to be green, quote unquote, if you're going to recycle, if you're going to be careful with your trash or with where you buy, you know, your eggs or anything like that, that you must be very far on a certain political spectrum, which is sad because that does tend to stifle a lot of the conversation. Yeah, it does because because we have word association, don't we? We stack concepts to, to one side or the other side of the political aisle, and that's really I think that's really really unhelpful. Um, and the same thing applies, I think, when it comes to um, uh, wealth and, and consumerism. You know, people think if you're wealthy, you can't be generous or you can't be. Uh, you know, can't care for the poor. It's it's, it's some really odd things, I think. But human nature, right? We stack these words together, and it's not it's not that helpful. Um, you, you've done um, you know, speaking of sort of studies on that, you studied at the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, so you, you've got some pretty good um, pretty good pedigree in the area of apologetics as well. I am so honored and blessed to have gone there. I still have no idea how I got in. I had no right to be there. Um, I, yeah, I still don't know how I ended up in that program. They only accept, or at that time, they were only accepting, I think, about 25 people a year from all over the globe. Um, but it was clearly just the Lord opened a door for me to go where I had no business going. Um, so I'll always be grateful for that. But yeah, being able to sit, sit at the feet of uh, Dr. John Lennox, uh, who was our biblical studies professor, learning from Alistair McGrath on, con you know, conversational apologetics and um, different apologetics methodologies and things like that. Um, and then, of course, we had, you know, guest speakers who came in every term, like Oz Guinness and um, Richard Swinburne and all these other big names. So, oh. yeah, looking back on it, sometimes I still can't believe that it happened. But I saved every single scrap of paper from my time in Oxford, and I've got all of them filed away, and I still go back when I'm writing talks, and I look at all the handwritten notes that I took, you know, back in 2013 and 2014. And um, so it's, it's, it's been a blessing. It continues to be a blessing. Well, Sandra, if, if you're going to drop names, those are some pretty darn good names to drop. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's what a privilege, but look, you, you've, you've been involved in apologetics. You've shared the gospel on, I understand on six different continents. That's a pretty good, uh, yeah. that's a pretty good record. <laughs> yeah. I'm still making my way to Antarctica sometime, but penguins aren't very good listeners, so I'm not too worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> penguins need saving though, so we need to sort that one out. Oh uh, no, very good. <laughs> hey, look, the reason one of the reasons I want to talk to you is it's kind of a little bit of sweet. You, you currently work for uh, an organization called called the Lighten Group. Um, and you're involved uh, heavily in apologetics and you're involved in that the whole um, the idea of presenting the gospel, um, answering questions, answering tough questions for people who've got questions about God, about the universe, about creation. And I love the fact that you bring the balance between science and faith. I mean, that's that's a part of what you're about, right? You have deep understanding of science and, and that doesn't challenge your faith. That just, I presume that just enhances it. Yeah, very true. I, um, I'm also blessed to have been raised by a couple of nerds so my dad, you know, my mother and father have written, I think, about 30 books between the two of them on a wide variety from um, biblical archaeology to paleontology um, and, and lots of other uh, various things. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I think from an early age, they taught me to be very curious. And I'm so grateful that, you know, it's a, that I, I was taught early on, it's okay to be interested in scientific things um, and still love the Lord. And as I continue to pursue the scientific field, yeah, I found myself just falling more and more in love with him. So every time I look at the bugs and the birds and space and whatever else, it's, uh, it's an act of worship for sure, um, not something that causes more doubt. Yeah, I, I love that. I had a guest on recently, Dr. Luke Barnes, who's a 
uh, astrophysicist, basically cosmologist out of the Western University of Sydney. And uh, he just loves talking stars and stuff, you know, that most of it makes our heads fall off. But um, and he's just a scruffy Australian surf, surfy guy, but with huge credibility. And uh, I, I love the fact that that we can engage with real people of, yeah. of deep, you know, deep intellect about things which are deeply intellectual. And it, and it, and it just reaffirms the, the wonder of what God has done. Yeah, I listened to that uh, episode, actually, and I was just nerding out. Um, so, yeah, I, I love what Luke said. He did a great job. That was very enjoyable for me to hear. Great term, nerding out. I love that. I love that. So, look, I wanted to ask you about the Lighten Group. Tell me about, tell me about what the Lighten Group is and does and who you are, because you've got multiple skills within the Lighten Group. So tell me, what, what's your kind of core cool business? Yeah, so we are in the business of evangelism by way of apologetics. Um, so uh, I, I kind of view Christian apologetics as pre-evangelism in a way. So it's identifying and bringing down those stumbling blocks between a person and Christ. Um, and then, of course, after you've cleared the, cleared the path, cleared the way, you can point to the cross and say, there it is, there's the answer you've been looking for. Now you can see it clearly. Um, so, so yeah, we're in the um, apologetics and evangelism um, way. Um, I don't like to say business because you have to make money to be a business. <laughs> we definitely aren't. Yeah. <laughs> um, by the grace of God, we're continuing on. But, you know, you know how hard it is to start up a new ministry. It can be really hard. Yeah. Um, but but so we we kind of um, were coming out of a time of deep darkness and just sort of we all had a lot of questions coming out of that season as well. But I think we were what we wanted to do was to bring light in the darkness, even even while we were feeling broken, um, you know, and, and sort of that picture of the the blind beggar telling another blind beggar where he can find bread. Um, and that's basically how we felt as a group, you know, very crippled, very confused, but just wanting to yeah. continue to point to Jesus. And, and I should frame that up. And so, so Lighten Group is, is, I was going to say survivors, but that's not, that doesn't really do you justice. But, but essentially, you know, a survivor group who has reformed um, to continue their passion out of the Ravi Zacharias uh, group, uh, Ravi Zacharias Ministries, which now virtually non-existent um and, and the whole fall of ravi but through that god has continued to be faithful to be sovereign the, your message has never changed right your, your title has changed it's, an, it's a new grouping but but nothing has changed in terms of your passion your mission the, the people you're seeing getting saved it's all just kind of well i was going to say business as usual but you know what i mean it's it's the same thing going on for you and 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 you're still called to that same thing difficult season wow. as you oh, there's my dog oh, that's my dog commenting he's yeah it's great radio fan um oh, it's, it's always good to have the commentary of a dog yeah that's right <laughs> i fully endorse it <laughs> endorse the dog um but so how you know can i ask you how how are you doing because it's been a couple of years of yeah you've been you've been smashed around right um, yeah, I, uh, how am I doing? Wow. I don't know how I'm doing. Um, so I'm here and I'm very focused on continuing the task at hand. Um, I, yeah, I think it's, I think that there was damage and maybe some wounds that I'm not fully aware of yet. Um, I had my first panic attack, which wasn't fun. I had no idea what was happening. I thought I was having a heart attack. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of strange things happening to us at that time. There were a lot of threats. There was a lot of really awful things happening on social media, which can be deeply psychologically damaging. Um, people's tires kept randomly getting popped in the parking lot. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was it was a strange time, and and it was extra strange for me, John, because I arrived on the scene September first. That was my start date with RZIM, uh, and September seventh was the day that the report was released. So I had 
just moved to, I had just moved my whole life, everything I owned to Atlanta. And seven days later, the bomb dropped. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was extra difficult for me. Um, but, but definitely the Lord brought me there for a reason, <laughs> you know, cause in the beginning I was like, Lord, why did you bring me here? Uh, but I think he brought me there to be a minister of ministers and to minister to people as RZAM was sort of dying. Um, and it was interesting because I was coming from being a hospice worker before that. So I can see how the Lord was preparing me at, you know, the deathbed of someone to come and be with a grieving family of sorts. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was really difficult. It was really hard. But I think where I am now to answer your question is I feel very weak Um sometimes a little unsure of myself, but more convinced than ever of the faithfulness of God, more convinced than ever of his power and his love and his really wonderful plans. Um, and I know it's not going to be easy, um, but I'm just ready to keep following his voice into the darkness wherever we end up. I know he'll be there. I'm always reminded, well, I mean, I have this kind of side passion for stained glass windows. I, I just, I marvel at what's been done over the centuries and people, modern artists still doing them, but essentially they've taken little tiny bits of broken stuff and created something, you know, absolutely magnificent out of brokenness. This is the Talk Sessions, I'm JP. It is uh, just on the 17 after 8, my conversation during the week with Zandra Carroll, and uh, apologies for my dog uh, adding comments in. She was being a bit uh, a bit wild this week. Um, Zandra, with um, the Lighten Group, and of course, as she's described, come out of uh, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries and the devastation uh, that followed that. It's the Talk Sessions with JP. You know, John, there was a day when I was in the chapel and I was on my knees and I was crying and I was asking God, what can you do here? Um, and I was looking at the carpet <laughs> because I was on the floor, uh, but the carpet had this pattern, like fr a fractal pattern and like stained glass. And the Lord comforted me so deeply in that moment. And he gave me a picture of RZIM, like this beautiful, big blue window that was just shattered in a moment into many small pieces. But each one of those little pieces, he so gently picked up in his hand and he started making a new window that was showing a picture. And it was a picture of himself. Yeah. You know, like in a church stained glass window. And I, I see him bringing that to fruition because there are all these ministries that are coming up now. We've got, you know, five people over here making this ministry and four people over here making that ministry. And we've got, you know, our little handful here at the yeah. line group. And we've got one over here that's doing a podcast and also speaking. And then we've got a humanitarian group over here. So there are so many people who came out of that brokenness that the Lord is raising up. And I think ultimately, as long as we're still showing the picture of Jesus. Um, it doesn't make the wrongs that happened right. It doesn't necessarily take away the pain, but that's what keeps us going. One of the disadvantages of being who I am is that I feel the, I feel the pain of God sometimes for people, but which comes at, at odd moments. <laughs> and that's just, this is one of those moments. I feel, I feel God's pain for you. And, um, uh, but I, I love that picture of stained glass windows. I love that picture of God is doing something new and fresh so his light can shine through it, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so fantastic that you've picked up, that, you know, that he's picked up those pieces with you and carrying on because, you know, lesser people would walk away and never come back. And not just from a, from a ministry, they'd walk away from the church and never come back. But humans are fractured beasties, right? We are fractured Fractured animals, and uh, and God continues to use us. I mean, you come, sometimes you, you marvel, why does God bother with us? Because we are sometimes, you know, 
it'd be easier just to start again, right? Just push the button and say, let's just try this one again. But but he's amazing, right? So his sovereignty for me, the sovereign sovereignness of God, continuing with his plan. It's, he hasn't deviated, he's still going. So so bless you for, for your strength in that because and your vulnerability and what you've just said, goodness. Panic attacks and things. I mean, that's just that's just amazing. But opportunities for God to show to show his compassion, to show his mercy, to show his power, I think, and that's that's absolutely fantastic. And you know, and, and one of the tragedies, and, and I talked about this over, over the last couple of weeks, and of course last week talking with Justin Humphreys from from um, 318 Ministry about about abuse in the church and so forth. And and uh, I'm astounded at how our Christian brothers and sisters sometimes can be so mean <laughs> when, you're, when you're down, right? Popping tires and social media attacks and bits and pieces. The very moment we need to be cradled, somehow we, we attack people. And that's, we've got to stop that one right from the start, right? It's just, it's kind of crazy. So... I, I, can, I want to ask you some questions about what people ask you, because I'm always intrigued to know. I mean, we all have different giftings, right? Some are called to be apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some pastors, some evangelists, right? So there's this wonderful mix of people. And so not everyone is sharing, sharing their faith in the way that you get to do that on a day-to-day basis. What are the big questions? What are, what are the stumbling blocks that people need to get over? Is it shame? Is it this feeling of guilt? Is it like I can't believe in a heaven what, or I can't believe that someone would actually love me and all of my mess? What, what's, what are the big blocks that people present to you? Well, as of now, with this next generation, um, you know, high school age kind of generation, um, it's really about sexuality, John. A lot of questions about sexuality. Um, why does God care who I sleep with? Why can't I become a woman if I feel like a woman just because I'm in the body of a man, you know, or um, why, why is homosexuality wrong? Or, you know, why is polygamy wrong? Why, why are these things wrong there if they're natural and if they feel good and if they feel right? Um, Or people will think like, you know, okay, I have gone a certain path in my life sexually. Is there ever any coming back? Mm. Is it over? Right. We get that. A lot of questions about pornography. I mean, a lot of people start getting into that and then it's just this deep hole that sucks you in. And we've got these 13 year old girls who are writing us and asking, how do I get out of this because of my pornography addiction? Yeah. Um, and, and that's very different from how it was, you know, a generation ago. That's just the truth. It's a, just a bit of a different world now. So a lot of questions about sexual identity, sexual freedoms, et cetera. Um, and then we do get a lot of science. Um, actually, it's so interesting seeing how the Lord patched together this team. And we will tell you, we never thought the people on the team are the people that like would have ended up forming a group. Um, but we've got Lou Phillips, who talks about sexuality. Then we've got myself and I talk about a lot of science or, you know, suffering is also another one of my fortes. And then Alicia Wood, who's brilliant, who talks about sociology and, um, you know, and also like criminal justice and all these things. She, we all talk about everything, but it's just really neat to see how the Lord collated this team and poised us to be able to a- answer some of these questions that are coming up from high schoolers that we weren't even necessarily didn't know what they would be asking. Um, So yeah, it's, I think there's a lot of desire to hear stories now and understand feelings. Whereas before, when I was studying Christian apologetics, it was about making the claims and and proving it's true. People aren't necessarily interested in, you know, give me premise one, premise two conclusion. They're interested in uh, I feel this way, prove me wrong. Um, so it's, it's quite, apologetics is changing and it's looking different. And that's, uh, you know, to be expected. The world, the world always changes. The questions will change and therefore the answers need to change. But we're trying to be flexible and follow the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, I think apologetics is a profoundly spiritual endeavor. And it never ceases to amaze me how many people get into this rut of just, only theology, like only book knowledge. Yeah. That's all you can have. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I think it's a big disservice yeah. to 
Apologize. Well, I mean, I find I find it really, really interesting and, you know, fascinating the, the conversations that we have with people because it seems to me that, that there's a single theme that people really are presenting and that is they, they don't know their value. And, and I always refer to Imago Day, you know, created in the image of God. This is how we are created, right? Created marvelously, wonderfully, beautifully. In, incredible potential that we have. And, you know, and I follow and read some of the great neuroscientists, uh, people like Stephen Kotler and, and, and talking about the, the capacity of our brain for incredibly huge and, you know, great things. And, and, and I, I think I've been reading um, about uh, Viktor Frankl, who, I don't know if you're familiar with Frankl's work, I mean, Frankl wrote Man's Search for Meaning. I just read it. Yeah, I just yeah. finished it. I mean, incredible, so right? So, so, so a, 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 a Jewish um, Austrian uh, psychologist and, and researcher and, and, and was interned in, I think, four different concentration camps during the Second World War. Jewish man, incredible to survive. You know, and I, and I, I saw some quotes from one of his contemporaries, Sigmund Freud, who talked about our search for happiness was meaningless, absolutely, you know, fruitless search. And so we, we end up seeking pleasure instead. And Frankel counters that by saying that when we can't find purpose and meaning, we default to pleasure. It's like we, we can't find the purpose and meaning that we want. So what we do is we just medicate ourselves. And, and, I, and I look at these young people who are experimenting with sexuality and drugs and the rest of it. All they're trying to do is find their value, right? They're trying to find that message that says you are truly unique. And, and the wonderful word that Frankel uses, and I, and I use this a lot with people, is that you are irreplaceable. There's no two Zandras in the world. You, you have a unique DNA string, a unique experience, a unique journey, and God has created you one out of 7.8 billion, which is just enough to blow your mind just like that, right? And I, and, I, and I often think this is the conversation, right, where people are looking to find their value. Yes, and the world cannot give that to them, John. Exactly. Because yeah. the world says, you manufacture your own value. I mean, I met with a girl a couple of weeks ago. I, uh, I guess it doesn't matter if I tell you what town it was, but she was in all but one of my talks through the conference. She was glued to me the entire time. And she had a huge scar running across her eye, just like that. And she came up to me um, and she, she said, you know, I'm an agnostic and I really don't agree with the things that you've been saying. Um, but I just, I just felt like I wanted to talk to you. I just felt like I needed to talk to you because I just feel like there's something. And I, she, she was very confused. She was just like, it was almost like she was drawn, but she didn't know why. Um, and we talked about her experiences and it turns out that she had been in the foster care system since she was five. She had been horrifically abused um, she was a teenager, uh, she, at this point. Um, and so she hated herself, but the world kept saying like, you can make your own purpose. You can make your own destiny. But, but she was realizing if I don't love myself, I can't. So she went and saw some sort of shaman or something to, and paid her to give her the power of self-love. And this shaman did some sort of incantation or something and over this girl and she went away with the feeling of love in her heart. Well, that dissipated over the course of a week and she ended up hating herself even more than she had before. And so I talked to her about how we have to have love that comes from outside. We cannot manufacture love on our own and that there is a source of love that is eternal, that yeah. will never run dry, that can cover over everything. And, you know, who has not only is ready to love you, but knows everything that has happened to you and everything that you've done and wants to forgive you, is eager to forgive you. And so I asked if she'd be willing for, for me to pray for her, you know, in the same way that the shaman had kind of done a blessing over her. I said, can I bless you in the name of my God, in the name of Jesus? And she said, yes. So put my hands on her. I prayed for her. And when I finished praying, I looked into her face and her eyes were very wide. Um, and I, so I said, what did you, do you know, did you feel something while I was praying for you? And she said, yes. She said, I felt something inside of me that wasn't me. And it had a weight to it. And uh, I said, did it feel like a good thing or a bad thing? And she said, it felt like a good thing. And she described 
to me and I said, okay, let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Um, and let's talk about, um, you know, I, I just shared the gospel with her again as clearly as possible. And um, I, unfortunately, she didn't reach out to me anymore uh, after that point. But the fact of the matter is you've got so many kids, just like this girl yeah. who have been told time and time again, just love yourself. It'll be enough. It's never going to be enough. Yeah. You need, we are designed as eternal beings. Our souls are eternal or now we're in a temporal state. Okay. We're used to moving through time. Our bodies are aging. You've lost hair, John. My hair is turning white. we both have more wrinkles than the last time we saw each other. We're in a temporal state, but we are eternal beings. Yes. So our hearts crave things that are eternal and you can't tell an eternal person to just take little sips of love and, and hope that it's enough. It's, it's not going to be enough. You know, and, and that girl, I mean, interesting, isn't it? She, she attended all of your lectures, but one, you know, glued to you. And that, I mean, that's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, that's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and uh, you know, when, when God touches someone inside like that, I love that. She felt this weight, this thing inside. That's permanent, right? I mean, that's like, it's like she's now imprinted. It's like something's been woken up in her. So, I mean, I have no doubt that she will come to faith and find Jesus and, and, and find her place. Uh, and you get to be that little, that little key in the door that, that opens it and, what a wonderful, wonderful feeling it must be to to help someone move a step closer to uh, to understanding a loving God. And uh, wow, this is a big conversation because I mean, I can. And, I mean, we're doing this on Zoom, so my audience doesn't have the have the advantage of seeing your eyes when you speak, and your eyes light up, which is you know, just speaks of of your passion for for people. Can, how do people engage with you? Because I mean, you're kind of an adopted Kiwi daughter. You might be living in Atlanta, but, you know, we kind of claim you because you spent quite a bit of time here working and being part of, of apologetics in this country. So the seed in the ground here for you. But how, how do we support you? How do we contact you? If people want to know more about what you do, where do, where do they go? Oh, you're so kind to ask. I really appreciate that. Uh, they can go to our website um, and maybe we can put it um, in the description below, but it's uh, www.lightengroup.org. Uh, and they can go to the Lighten Group website, and there's a place there where you can invite a speaker to come speak at your event, or you can donate, uh, you can give us funds. We would all really appreciate that. Absolutely. So we keep putting food on the table and keep doing what we're doing. Um, and also you can read some of the updates and some of the wonderful stories of what God is doing through our humble little team. So it's, yeah. Will, will, you, will you do this? Will you do a Zoom? If someone wants you to connect with a, with a youth group or a church group, you, 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 can do, you can do your presentation by Zoom. You can, or Microsoft Teams or however, you can video in and you're happy to do that? Oh, of course. Yeah, I'm speaking at two conferences in New Zealand in July over Zoom. So um, I'm, I'm happy to, to present over Zoom. Of course, it's not the same. I love to be in that place with those people. Um, but, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's still a privilege to be able to, to do that virtually. So absolutely. Oh, yeah. You can't beat laying hands on people, praying for them and seeing the whites of their eyes and the feeling the, the response to Jesus. No, absolutely. But yeah, Zoom is, is kind of a, yeah, it's the next best thing. So fantastic. Was Andrew Carroll, how lovely to bump into you. Well, I'm not going to miss my flight this time. Um, <laughs> and, uh, thank you for being so, uh, so vulnerable and sharing some of the story because I know it's been painful the last couple of years. And uh, I can't imagine walking in on the first of the month and then seven days later, you know, you, the whole thing rolls over, the ship completely, completely sinks. So that's, that's crazy stuff. But God is still God. And here you are, still doing what you're doing, still passionate. Uh, and lovely and, 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 and I'm fascinated talking to you. So thank you so much. And uh, again, for people looking for the website, it's Lighten Group, L-I-G-H-T-E-N, lightengroup.org. And you can make contact with Zandra through there. Hey, have a, have a wonderful evening in Atlanta. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you, John. God bless you. She is quite a treasure, let me tell you. And uh, the conversation, we officially ended the interview there, but we talked for quite some hours uh, and I think it's a remarkable what, what God can do, right? I, I do love that picture of um, the whole idea of uh, stained glass window, that, that God, you know, people, artisans create this magnificent pictures out of little tiny broken pieces. That's what the gospel is about, right? It's about taking the broken pieces and putting them back together into, into something which shines the light of Jesus through it. 
Uh, you know, I'm reminded uh, a couple of pieces from the Psalms, you know, I want to encourage you with tonight. Psalm 56 verse 8 says, you've kept track of my every toss and turn through the sleepless nights. Each tear entered in your ledger, each ache written in your book. Psalm 56 verse 8. In Psalm 34 18, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. There is just so many pieces of scripture that will talk to you about um, about what God will do for you and with you. And, and you know, again, in Isaiah, go back to the Old Testament uh, book of Isaiah, and it says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. You know, maybe there's some people listening tonight that need to know that God's justice is on the way for you. That is the promise of God, that he will bring justice to you. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the term justice or injustice to God is a major, major thing. You know, God, God says in his word, I hate injustice. I hate injustice. Now, that's a big statement from God, right? From a big God saying he hates something. Therefore, how much more will he rescue? How much more will he introduce to you? Uh, his favor, his restoration, his rescue. Again, Scripture says he will leave the 99 and come looking for that one. And maybe if you're that one tonight, maybe if you are feeling that tossing and turning, that, 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 that you've cried a number of tears and you don't know what's happened in your life, God is on your case, right? That is his promise. He'll come looking for you. That's who he is. The Talk Sessions with JP. Call now to have your say. 0508 54 